one. In this case, some of the names have been changed. Missing person report. On August 4, 1982, the Ventura County, California Sheriff's Department received a call about a missing woman. When 25-year-old Marcy Davis hadn't been heard from in almost two days, her sister became worried. Several hours later, the department received a call about a vehicle stuck and abandoned in a ditch. A check of the plates revealed that it belonged to Marcy Davis. There was no sign of her. She might have walked away to find help and possibly run into worse trouble. Or someone else may have ditched the vehicle. The cold engine made it impossible to determine how long it had been there. A pair of women's jeans found nearby suggested foul play. But the place was used as a dumping ground for all sorts of trash. Because the car provided the first real clue to Marcy Davis's fate, Ventura County Sheriff scoured the scene to see what else they might find. They prepared for the worst. They found it. Assigned to the case was Sergeant Larry Robertson. The uh, patrol division had decided that they should bring in a search and rescue team to look for the body. In fact, they, they did find the body. Uh, she had been found strangled and left nude, uh, buried under leaves and debris. Have you called forensics? Marcy Davis's blouse had been torn and tied tightly around her neck. It appeared she might have been raped. The forensics team photographed any clues they could find in the gloom but decided to abandon the scene until daylight. A guard was posted to keep it secure. Investigators had plenty of other work to do before sunrise. Hey, have you seen my cigarettes? Mm-mm. Can I take those? The victim's sister told police that Marcy had left the house on the night of August 3rd to go to a Tupperware party. She fun. said that afterward, she was going to JJ's, her favorite hangout. Buy you more Tupperware? Yeah. Hi, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? Good. Came by, we to Detectives ask you a talked to the bartender about, uh, at JJ's. Can you describe the men she was with? She told them that the victim had come in around 11 the night she disappeared. Meets with her friends. She said that Davis was drinking and playing pool with another bar regular named Michael Nottingham. They left with all the other patrons around closing time, 2 a.m. Because Nottingham was the last person the victim had been with, investigators went to see him. At the time, we feared that perhaps Michael Nottingham was with her, and he also had been a homicide victim. And we just hadn't found his body yet. So number one, we were trying to establish whether or not his well-being could be uh, verified. They found him not safe Marshall. at home. He agreed to come to the station to talk. They showed him a photograph of Marcy that her sister provided. That's Teresa. He recognized the face, but not the name. She told you her name is Teresa? He knew her as Teresa. She gave him a ride home, came in for about 10 minutes, then left. That's the last he saw of her, he said. Nottingham told them that after she drove off around 3 a.m., he walked to his girlfriend's house and crashed outside until her mother left at 9.30. He said that nobody saw him during that time. 
After Nottingham gave his statement, police went to the house he shared with his sister. They wanted to speak with her to see if she could confirm his alibi. She recognized the face in the picture as a woman Michael came home with the other night. She corroborated his account of the time spent at home, up to a point. She said he introduced the woman as Kelly. And that wasn't the only difference. She recalled that Michael and Kelly both got into her car and left together. Uh, obviously, this was very different from the statements that Michael had given to us. The sheriff's department now had a conflicting story and a six-hour gap in Michael Nottingham's alibi. Suspicion was building, but they had nothing solid. Any forensic clues found in the victim's car would only support Nottingham's account that he'd been in it. Investigators needed something to prove that Nottingham had been at the crime scene. Okay. And the bodies up here. Okay. Okay, now what's going on? Okay. What I found By the light of day, uh, investigators car. returned to the yeah, scene to search for any clues to link him there. The lengthy process left no stone or leaf unturned. While processing the scene, uh, I sat on the ground in the immediate vicinity of the body and as we were taking leaf and branches off one at a time looking for evidence. I sat on the ground next to the body for, I would say, at least an hour, perhaps an hour and a half. And with this we found about six feet away from the vehicle, cigarette box. Investigators found a tentative clue, a filterless cigarette butt on the ground near the abandoned vehicle matched Nottingham's brand. The clue was weak, but coupled with the conflicting stories, it allowed police to arrest Nottingham on suspicion of rape and murder. All they had to do now was prove it. Nottingham was taken into custody. As a matter of course, for okay. cases of sexual okay. assault, he Step was back. stripped and photographed. Take off your shirt, boys. Investigators looked for scratches, scrapes, or any other evidence to indicate he may have struggled with his victim. They found something else entirely. What about the... Uh as many as 100 small and unusual insect bites dotted his ankles and waistline. Nottingham said they were flea bites. Investigators weren't sure of their significance, but they documented the marks just in case. That night, Sergeant Robertson was awakened by itching around his ankles and waist. He recognized the unforgettable I symptoms. Know, we I told my wife, if I didn't know better, I would say that these bites on me uh, that itched profusely were chigger bites, and they were just exactly like the chigger bites I had experienced in guerrilla warfare training in, in Kentucky during the Vietnam era. That these are the sites where they normally attack. After his physician confirmed his diagnosis, Detectives wondered if these little creatures could somehow provide their big break. They needed an expert's advice. They consulted entomologist James Webb, who specializes in parasitic insects. He told them that chiggers are larvae, the newly hatched spawn of a certain group of mites. They're born with a voracious appetite and are adept at procuring their meal. And they insert their mouth parts into the host's skin. Uh, and then with this special blade, there's one on each side. And then they'll actually inject saliva into the wound. And the saliva then dissolves the protein of the skin. And that 
pool of uh, liquid then is actually sucked into the chigger uh, with a special uh, gut pump. It brings the, the material into the uh, intestine, into the gut of the chigger. The saliva triggers the host's immune system, causing a red, itchy bump around the bite, usually within 24 to 48 hours. A survey of the investigators who searched the scene of Marcy Davis's murder revealed that most bore the telltale marks of a chigger attack. It's not by the individual bite that we recognize the chigger bite. We recognize it more as a pattern, and usually at a place where there's constriction of clothing, because the chigger, when the chigger moves up the body, it'll stop along the sock line, or the panty line, or the underwear line, or the belt line. Out of a case with no real clues, a pattern began to emerge. Michael Nottingham's bite marks were carefully photographed again at life size. It appeared the murder might have had dozens of witnesses after all. Investigators hoped that by catching chiggers, they could catch Marcy Davis's killer. I think we can do it. Suspect Michael Nottingham swore he'd never been to the area where the victim's body was found. Sergeant Larry Robertson believed the chigger bites on Nottingham's body might tell a different story. But I had never ever experienced chiggers in all my years of living in Ventura County. Even though I was active in search and rescue and hunting and fishing, I had never heard of chiggers in Ventura County and never seen them and have never read about them in Ventura County. In fact, they were exceedingly rare in this part of California. If investigators could isolate chiggers to the crime scene, they would have undeniable proof that Nottingham had been there. They called on Dr. Webb for help. The thing we wanted to do at the crime scene was see if there were chigger mites there to substantiate this hypothesis. And we knew that lizards are good indicators of finding chiggers. Chiggers attach to lizards and feed off them. Traps were laid to catch the lizards for examination. Once they were found to be infested, Webb and his team broke out the chigger traps. A chigger trap is nothing more than a small black plastic plate that's placed where chiggers are likely to gather. The sun heats it up, providing a warm welcome for the pesky larvae. These creatures are hungry, not smart. This thing is a warm body, much like a living animal. And so the chiggers, if they're in the vicinity, will move towards the plate and crawl around on the plate, looking for a place to, to attach. Webb's team set their traps outside the house of Nottingham's girlfriend, where Nottingham claimed he spent the night sleeping. They placed more traps 20 feet away from the murder scene, and others even closer to the spot where the victim had been found. They checked the traps every half hour during daylight for three days. The results were clear. Not too far from the murder scene where the, where the body was found, we were getting tens or 20 or more at a time running around in the black plate. I mean, just large numbers. We also noticed them running around in our shoes when we were standing in that same spot and um, crawling up onto us. But just 20 feet away from the body, the chigger activity was minimal. And at the girlfriend's house, they found none at all. The proximity of the chiggers to the victim established Nottingham's presence at the crime scene. I believe uh, from our research, this was the first time that entomology had ever been used in a, in a capital case, a murder case, to assist investigators in placing the suspect at the scene of the crime. From what police could piece together, the victim drove Nottingham to the woods. Maybe she wanted to go, maybe he forced her to go there. 
Once there, they began to fight. It escalated, and Nottingham beat and killed her, finally strangling her with her shirt. Michael Nottingham was convicted of attempted rape and the first degree murder of Marcy Davis. He was sentenced to life without possibility of parole. Danger can lurk on the outskirts of town or it may lurk even closer to home. Seattle, Washington, once a rugged forest land, now it's a world-class city of 500,000. Some people come here to take advantage of new opportunities. Others come here just to take advantage. 28-year-old Molly McClure had grown up in Seattle and had been away a few years. In October 1985, she moved back to be closer to her family. She rented a modest apartment and found a job she loved as a hotel restaurant consultant. In January 1986, she called the police to report an attempted break-in at her apartment. Her upstairs neighbor, Sherwood Knight, told her he'd seen someone trying to jimmy her window while he was out for his morning jog. He scared the intruder off. The tampering on the window was plain to see. The police made out a report. That seemed like the end of it. But the next day, January 17th, police were called once again to McClure's apartment. They arrived there at the request of her boss, who had phoned them when she failed to show up for work and didn't answer her phone. Officers found her door locked and noticed what appeared to be some new damage to the window. Fearing that McClure might be in trouble, the officers slipped inside. They saw no signs of disturbance. Nothing seemed out of place. Then, in the bedroom, they found Molly McClure murdered in her bed. Does it seem to be working that way? Homicide was called in. Detective Hank Gruber was assigned to the case. The young lady was laying face down on the bed, and she was partly covered with a, uh, a blanket, but her head was exposed. She had obvious wounds to the back of her head. There was a gag in her mouth with panties, and they were tied with a sock. The medical examiner was able to tell from the hemorrhages in the victim's eyes that she had been strangled. From the degree to which blood had pooled in her body, the ME could tell she had been dead four or five hours. While the apartment was processed for fingerprints or any other clues, the medical examiner carefully collected visible fibers and loose hairs from the body. The intensity of the crime scene processing was momentarily broken. Sherwood Knight came by to return a cookbook he'd borrowed. The neighbor from upstairs. How you doing? We're just doing a little checking around here. May I have your name? He was concerned about Sherwood Molly and stunned Sherwood. to hear that she was dead. Oh, this book I got. I'll tell you what, I'd like to do some more The detective sent him on his way and went back to processing the scene. The Washington State Crime Lab would scrutinize the trace evidence they gathered. 
detectives hoped that the solution to this case, if it existed at all, lay somewhere in these small bags. We had no idea who did this. Um, it wasn't like there were any witnesses or anything to go on, and the case was easily recognized as a case that, if it was going to be solved, would have to be done with trace evidence. Whoever had tried to invade McClure's apartment the night before had evidently returned to finish what he'd started. From the looks of it, Molly McClure's killer came in through the window of the spare bedroom. There, investigators found a footprint on the sill that didn't match the officer's shoes. This was their first clue that was bigger than a hair, and it needed to be preserved. After the sill was photographed, technicians collected it. If you can actually take the item that has the print on it, you have a way better chance of being successful in comparisons uh, than through pictures. Um, the actual item is always better. Um, so we took the windowsill at that time, and we had our samples from around the house. The print on the windowsill had to wait until investigators could find a shoe to compare it with. While the trace evidence was being analyzed, detectives sought to find rhyme or reason for the crime. The curious thing was why the culprit made two attempts to enter the victim's apartment. Detectives thought that McClure might have been a victim of circumstance. The couple that lived in the apartment before her had a history of domestic violence. Can I help you? The boyfriend had moved out several months earlier. Police theorized that he might have returned to kill his former girlfriend, not realizing that she too had moved away. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, she's married. She's here. Hey, Christy, you want to come on out? But when police paid him a visit, they found the couple had reconciled. Hi. Though the victim's apartment wasn't ransacked, police noticed her jewelry box was empty. A check of bank records showed that the victim's cash machine card was used at an ATM several blocks away around the time of her death. So in addition to murder and rape, the killer had come there to rob. At autopsy, the medical examiner determined that the rapist's blood was type O, but so was the victim's. No more detailed analysis could be performed on the samples. The medical examiner sent the trace evidence from the sheets to the state crime lab, where it was analyzed by supervising forensic scientist Chesterine Swicklick, now with Swicklick and Associates. She can tell a great deal from small fibers. Everybody has a characteristic set of debris on them. Everybody has just particles and fibers which may be found on nobody else in the world. Um, we, uh, we, sh we shed our hairs. We go to work and pick up fibers from the seat that we're sitting on and we may pick up, if the person who worked there with us is, has a dog and deposit dog hairs on that seat, we pick up some of those dog hairs and it then becomes part of our set of debris. Every time we're in contact with someone, we swap some of our debris. At a crime scene, it's up to forensics to determine whose is whose. Swicklick identified a piece of lint from clothing, blue synthetic fibers, a flake of tobacco removed from under the victim's fingernail, some cat hair, and 18 fragments of dark human hair. She determined that characteristics of the hair suggested it was from an African-American. It was definitely not that of blonde, blue-eyed Molly McClure. Detectives returned to the scene to collect more clues. The debris didn't seem like the victims, as she was also a non-smoker who was allergic to cats. But if the killer had left these traces, they would be concentrated around the victim and not elsewhere in the apartment. 
They collected samples of the debris from the floor of each room, moving to the corners where it tends to gather. They found no cat fur, no tobacco, no African-American hairs. A picture of the killer was emerging out of the dust. He could have been an anonymous intruder or someone closer to home. In a murder investigation, it's easier to eliminate familiar faces before looking for new suspects. Sherwood Knight, who had frightened off the burglar at the victim's window, had been helpful in the investigation, but detectives ran a check on him anyway. Gruber's partner, Detective Rudy Sutlovich, discovered that Knight had a record. And he had a history of robberies and burglaries and uh, other assaults. And he had uh, been released from prison approximately three months prior to this. Detectives paid a visit to Sherwood Knight and his girlfriend. The couple lived in the apartment above the victims. Knight's girlfriend told detectives that they had had a fight the night McClure was murdered. And so then you came back. Sherwood slept on the couch. She told police that she woke around 5:30 a.m. I don't think so. Knight was already out for his morning jog. He came home a short time later, wearing his jogging clothes like he always did. Then he rushed off for his class at North Seattle Community College. He was enrolled there, uh, but nobody could ever remember seeing him. Didn't go to his classes or anything, but he had been telling his girlfriend that he was going to school during the daytime. Based on his past record, investigators thought Knight might be guilty of more than playing hooky. I got it. I have a search warrant. A search step warrant. aside, please. Yes, we have some work we need to do here. On January 21st, four days after the murder, detectives served a search warrant on Knight's apartment. They were authorized to gather trace evidence collected from the corners of the apartment. Fiber samples from blankets, cat hair, the clothing Knight was said to have worn the night of the murder, and even the clothing he wore when they served the warrant. As it turned out, he was wearing the sweatshirt he usually jogged in. Detectives found the jogging pants soaking in a bucket of water. They collected the pants, bucket and all. Knight was read his rights and taken into custody. There, his hair, blood, and saliva samples were collected. Authorities could hold him no longer than 48 hours unless the tests turned up evidence to directly link him to the crime. The shoe print left on the victim's windowsill matched the tread on running shoes taken from the suspect. But the sneaker was common and the print would match thousands of others all over Seattle. Testing the trace evidence was more time consuming. The pants had to be dried before they were looked at. The fibers had to be scrutinized one by one. Even matching hairs is tricky because two hairs taken from the same person might not necessarily match. If you just look at your own hair, the hair of someone who's sitting next to you, you could see some hairs are Thicker, some are thick, thinner, some are darker, some are lighter, some are coarser, some are finer. The 48 hours came and went without a definitive result. Knight had to be released. But little by little, the trace evidence began to tell the bigger story. The distinctive shape and pattern of some hairs revealed that they were from a cat. Their length and color matched Knight's pet. Then, Swicklick analyzed Sherwood Knight's pants. Red cotton fibers and cat hair were entangled in pills of lint found clinging to them. The pills matched the lint found on the victim. She still wasn't satisfied. Even though it's very compelling evidence, 
I would have to say there is a possibility it could have come from another pair of pants with red cotton and with cat hairs. Cats are not a rare species. The red cotton is not unusual. As her testing continued, more fibers on the victim matched other items taken from Knight's apartment. His hairs, too, matched those from the crime scene. As incriminating as that evidence seemed to be, investigators feared that no jury would buy a case that was solved by lint and cat hair. They sought an array of evidence since no single irrefutable piece had been found. But they were getting closer. They discovered telltale blood stains around the waistband of Knight's sweatshirt. The droplets had apparently escaped Knight's notice. Technicians tested them against the suspect's and victim's own blood. Though tests weren't as precise in the 1980s as they are today, the blood was found to be consistent with the victims, a Caucasian with type O. Now investigators had blood as well as hair and fibers to implicate the suspect. All these little circumstances would not be sufficient to charge somebody with a murder or any crime. But accumulating each one of these little circumstances, they all add up so long as they're all consistent with the same conclusion, which is that Sherwood Knight was in Molly's apartment that morning and that he's the one who committed the murder. Investigators were ready to bring him in. The only problem was where to find him. Man. When Seattle police went to arrest Sherwood Knight for the murder of Molly McClure, they learned he'd fled. A manhunt eventually led to an informant who told police of his whereabouts. How about you, partner? On April 23rd, Sherwood Knight was arrested. Based on the evidence and interviews with Knight's acquaintances, a picture of the victim's last hours came into focus. Sherwood Knight had faked the first break-in so that he could scope out the victim's apartment while winning her trust. The next night, he broke in, attacked, and killed her, but not before forcing her to reveal her cash machine password. For his crimes, Sherwood Knight received life without parole. The McClure case was solved on the combined weight of tiny fibers, a drop of blood, and a few strands of cat hair. In a hotel in Ohio, investigators had even less to link a killer to the crime scene. Blue Ash, Ohio is a quiet town just outside of Cincinnati. People here guard their privacy. In this story, the names of the victim and her family have been changed. On September 3, 1994, Bert Stein and June Mays had come to Blue Ash for a family reunion. They'd left their sister, Rose Levy, in the room while they went to breakfast. Rose had promised to join them, but hadn't made it. Oh! Oh my oh. God, Rose. I don't know. Rose, Rose. is she breathing? A joyful occasion turned into a family tragedy when they discovered 68-year-old Rose collapsed on the floor of their suite. They had been gone only 30 minutes. Rose. Hello, desk. Rose. She clung to life, this, this but just barely. From the looks of it, she had suffered a heart attack or a stroke. Move back. Everybody, please move back. Medical technicians raced to save her. Police arrived, too, as part of their normal procedure. Rose Levy died in the hospital. It wasn't a heart attack or stroke that killed her. 
Sachi had been beaten to death. By the time the victim reached the hospital, bruises and welts had begun to form. Among them were heel marks on her chest and a strange rectangular mark evidently caused by the murder weapon. The medical examiner couldn't discern what it was. Further examination revealed that two of the victim's teeth had been knocked out and several bones in her face had been fractured. The damage she received was equal to what a body endures when it hits a brick wall at 40 miles per hour. This was the unforgettable face of a homicide. Blue Ash, Ohio police launched an investigation. The room was cordoned off and scoured for clues. Determining the useful clues wasn't easy. Assigned to the case were detectives Jim Schaefer and Larry Stokes. The crime scene was extremely contaminated by the time uh, investigators got there, but it was only because of the attempts to resuscitate her. Detective Jim Schaefer. Besides blood, there was a, a footprint that was discovered in uh, the bathroom and a lot of other items that were later found to be uh, items left as a, by rescue workers. Rose, you awake? Are you there? According to June Mays and Bert Stein, Rose was still dressing when they were ready to go to breakfast. Are you in there? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. yeah, she told the couple to go ahead without her. All right, don't forget She'd be down in a minute to join them. Okay. Okay? All right. She, she, no, she's going to take a shower. She never made it. As the investigation continued, some items were discovered missing. Mays, who left her purse in the room while she was at breakfast, noticed that $500 was taken from it. Thank you, ma'am. And where did you leave that purse? Later, the victim's family realized that when Rose was rushed to the hospital, she wasn't wearing a favorite ring and the custom-made pendant she never removed. They didn't turn up in a search of the room. Investigators recovered one of the victim's teeth from the carpet, but could find nothing to link a suspect to the robbery homicide. Stokes and Schaefer had their work cut out for them. Every guest and every employee was a potential witness or a potential suspect. According to Schaefer, everyone had to be questioned. With the uh, chart of the uh, over 100 uh, hotel employees and over 300 guests, uh, we, we started in on establishing uh, alibis or whereabouts for each of those uh, individuals. As detectives began the chore of sending surveys to guests in order to locate potential witnesses, they narrowed the field of potential suspects. The killer could only have struck during the 30 minutes that Bert and June were at breakfast. The door to the room locked automatically, so a person would have to have been let in or would have needed a key to gain entry. Detectives focused on hotel employees who worked that shift and had access to pass keys. They asked each employee to account for his whereabouts during that half hour and to name someone who could vouch for him. The main object of this investigation at that point became, let's find out who can alibi for who during this time period. And the, per the one person that will not have an alibi will be someone definitely worth looking at. Investigators knew that it took a sick man to commit a crime this brutal. They were closer to the truth than they ever imagined. Detectives Schaefer and Stokes began to make progress on the Rose Levy homicide investigation as they culled the list of hotel employees. One employee made mention of Elwood Jones, a co-worker who had called in sick with a hand injury. Jones had filed for workers' compensation, saying he'd cut his hand on a metal stairwell on the job. Detectives called him in for an interview. 
He was one of the only employees who had no alibi during that fatal half hour. They wanted to know more about his injury. They went to Bethesda Oak Hospital, bringing along a court order giving them access to Elwood Jones's records. Jones had checked into the emergency room of the hospital three days after the murder with a serious hand injury. The small cut above the knuckle of his left index finger had already sealed up, but an infection festered within. Jones's hand was severely swollen and intensely painful. He was running a fever. Hand surgeon John McDonough was called in to examine the wound. This was a tremendous blow that he had taken to his hand because it tore the capsule of the joint and inoculated the bacteria directly into the finger joint. Uh, it would take a significant amount of pressure to have that occur. When McDonough asked Jones what happened, he said he'd cut it on a dumpster at work. Not only did that seem unlikely, it also contradicted what he told the staff earlier. Jones was left-handed. To McDonough, the position of the wound above the knuckle of the dominant hand indicated that the patient probably was wounded as he punched someone in the mouth. In fact, the injury was so characteristic of a so-called fight bite that McDonough had it photographed to use in his classes. If that were really the cause, McDonough wasn't surprised that his patient lied about it. People that have human bite injuries try to hide them. Uh, try to make light of them, tell you they did something else, like brushing their hand against the wall or cutting it on a dumpster. The wound, whatever had caused it, called for immediate surgery. McDonough opened and drained it. He reserved some of the fluid so that the infectious bacteria could be cultured and studied. Once it was identified, the proper antibiotic could be prescribed. A human mouth, even a clean one, is home to 42 species of bacteria. Someone with poor dental hygiene can have more. A human bite can be akin to being cut with an object from the bottom of a sewer. At the hospital microbiology lab, the bacteria from Elwood Jones's wound was incubated until the sample grew large enough to be recognizable. Culturing bacteria can happen overnight or take more than a week. Larry Gray is the director of the lab. The technologist on the workup bench will look at the plates. They will look at the organisms, the texture, how large they are, the colonies, the size, the color. The result is then stained, revealing more characteristics of the species when examined under a microscope. Finally, the bacterium is identified and antibiotics are administered. Jones, how are you Jones today? stayed in the hospital while his infection Good. was being treated. How's the hand? Much better. After the five days, he went home. Yeah, I'll get a copy of this and put it in his record. The doctor told the detectives uh, that Jones's hand was infected with Echinella corrodens. What the case was all about. It's a somewhat rare bacterium that thrives on dental plaque below the gum line. Well. Uh, and then this slide over to here find it inside a man's knuckle required some explaining. McDonough explained it. When the uh, hand strikes a tooth, the tooth may be broken or the sharp edge inoculates bacteria, and in this case, Iconella corrodens, deep inside the tissue. I've been doing hand surgery for almost 25 years, and I've only seen three cases of Iconella infection. All three of those were associated with a human bite injury. Detectives felt that Jones could have contracted Iconella from striking Rose Levy. Now they had what they needed to isolate Jones as the prime suspect. But Jones offered an explanation. He said that after he cut himself on the dumpster, he sucked the wound to clean it. Less than three-tenths of the population has Iconella bacteria in its saliva. 
but authorities had to be sure. They swabbed the inside of Jones's mouth and sent the swabs to the lab to be cultured. The results came back. They were negative. The infection was consistent with injuries incurred during the beating death of Rose Levy, and the rarity of the Iconella infection was enough for detectives to serve a search warrant on the apartment Jones shared with his girlfriend. They confiscated his shoes so they could compare their heel marks with bruises found on the victim. Jones's car was impounded and searched for fiber, blood, or other trace evidence to tie him to the crime. But the most compelling evidence was visible to the naked eye, a hotel passkey. And in a toolbox in the trunk lay the victim's missing pendant. Jones was arrested for the murder of Rose Levy. Prior to his trial, the bruising patterns on the victim were digitally enhanced and the murder weapon was revealed. The marks corresponded with the walkie-talkie that Jones carried on the job. His shoes also matched bruises found on the body. Based on the evidence, investigators put together the events in the hotel room. When Jones saw Bert Stein and June Mays leave for breakfast, he thought the coast was clear for robbery. The suite they shared usually had only two occupants. Jones had no reason to believe that September 2nd was any different. He used his passkey to enter. He didn't expect a witness. Excuse me. He knew he couldn't afford one. The murder accusation came from the victim's own mouth. On December 11, 1996, Elwood Jones was convicted of aggravated burglary, aggravated robbery, and aggravated murder. 